Eh, um, so today's speaker is Chiara Kamaota. Um, so pleasure to welcome her. Well, she, here in quotation marks. Um, so Chiara graduated in, in Rome in 2006, if I'm not mistaken, and then also completed her PhD also in, at La Sapienza in Rome. Then was a postdoc from approximately 2010 to 2013 in, in the Paris area, um, including in Saclay and Jussieu, Paris 6. Um, then was a researcher back in Rome at La Sapienza from 2013 to 2015. Mm -hmm. Then joined King's College in, in London, the, the Disordered Systems Group, and was there from 2015 to 2020, uh, first as a lecturer and then as a senior lecturer. And since um, last year, she is now an associate professor um, back at La Sapienza in Rome. Um, and today's topic is rough landscapes and glassy dynamics from inference to machine learning. So the screen is yours, Kiara. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, and of course, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for everyone uh, uh, for joining. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure. And uh, I think it would have been even more a pleasure to be there uh, in person. But let's start to know each other in this, uh, in this form and then, uh, and then we'll see. Um, uh, as uh, Tobias anticipated, yes, topic is uh, rough landscape and glass dynamics applied uh, to problems that uh, cover these uh, two different aspects, uh, machine learning on one side and the uh, inference. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, because as I try, I, I will argue in, the, in, this, uh, in this presentation, uh, there are very close uh, analogies uh, and the uh, know-how developed for the study of, uh, of glass physics uh, can be fruitfully used uh, in these uh, uh, new applications uh, to understand uh, um, both uh, why, uh, for example, learning dynamics work so well in the field of machine learning, uh, and also why actually um, similarly um, gradient-based dynamics, uh, we'll see learning dynamics is uh, typically gradient based on gradient descent, uh, why uh, gradient-based uh, dynamics uh, in general are not thought to be very valid for inference problem. Uh, and uh, whether it is actually possible to improve their performances uh, by knowing better what is this relation between the dynamics and the landscape. So that's the plan. And uh, uh, with this, uh, I mean, I'm not sure I'll cover all the, the material, then it will depend on the questions and on the speed of the presentation. Uh, but uh, uh, I refer to um, topics that I developed in the, this list of paper that will be also linked all along the slides. Um, first of all, of course, we need an introduction uh, and this background of glass dynamics and at least uh, some main tools that we'll be using and seeing emerging in all these other, uh, in these other applications. So, um, what's, uh, what's the problem of glasses is this understanding on why uh, these, uh, these systems uh, uh, do behave like solid while uh, having microscopic structure, which is uh, typical of, of a liquid. And the, um, of course, uh, the, uh, everyone knows that the reason is uh, that uh, this, uh, um, there is a lot going on in, in a glass, meaning that uh, the system is out of equilibrium all uh, the time. Most of the time, you, you see it out of equilibrium. And this has forced, of course, uh, the, uh, the people that wanted to understand uh, uh, how to handle them, how to predict their behavior, uh, to uh, develop tools uh, that would be able to describe out of equilibrium dynamic with a high precision. Um, so that's why this can help us in this understanding of learning dynamics or dynamics uh, uh, algorithms that can be used in inference. Um, what it is observed in glass dynamics. Uh, uh, first of all, how it can be observed. It can be observed in experiment, but also it can be observed uh, uh, by numerical simulation, so by uh, looking at the evolution of the coordinates of uh, uh, an assembly of particles that interact uh, through pair potentials uh, that depends on the distance between the particle. This is a standard typical Hamiltonian 
or energy of the system that one can consider in this, in this, uh, in this case, uh, and that would reproduce most of the phenomenology that is very interesting uh, for our purposes. Um, with this Hamiltonian, what one uh, realizes uh, is a dynamics based on Langevin, uh, the Langevin equation that controls the evolution of the degrees of freedom in terms of the gradient of this energy, and some added noise that takes into account, introduces in the field the, the role of the temperature, of course. Um, what is the result of this study? Of course, uh, uh, to study this out of equilibrium dynamics, the standard typical initial configuration that is easy to get uh, is to start from a random initial position for the particles. And uh, uh, by doing that and performing this Langevin dynamics, what it, we are observing is this uh, standard uh, uh, experimental protocol, which is the one of a quench, is called the quench. Uh, by doing that, both in experiment, and here you see instead the result of simulation, what one can see is that the energy of the system, which is this one-time quantity in this out of equilibrium dynamic, of course, is not constant, but has this very slow decay, which can be described as this logarithmic decay in this uh, uh, log linear plot. Um, this is one-time quantities, two-time quantities, uh, as a, for example, correlation function, but here you see uh, plotted uh, the mean square displacement of particles, uh, also show a peculiar behavior, which is the one of uh, developing uh, a plateau. These are for uh, mean square displacement at a later time uh, after the quench. So this is uh, short time, longer time. Uh, both these observations point in the direction of describing a uh, dynamics that is lower the later, okay, the further you are getting from the initial uh, time of the quench. And this is, uh, can be, be uh, seen by uh, thinking that the same amount of energy is covered in a very short time at the beginning and in a very long time at the end because of the log scale representation here, but also from the fact that this uh, plateau, the plateau itself is showing us that at a later time, uh, this mean square displacement uh, uh, stabilizes on a much uh, very low value before being able to escape from, from this, uh, uh, what is called typically the cage uh, of the system. So this is the phenomenology that um, uh, will be central in, uh, in uh, our discussion today. And uh, uh, it is interesting that uh, this similar phenomenology can be obtained by a completely different model uh, that are spin models, or in particular P-spin models, um, where you have this uh, uh, Hamiltonian, again, the energy of the system is defined in terms of uh, uh, this uh, product of spin variables that are coupled by these uh, interactions so that are just random variable. Uh, despite this uh, very different uh, uh, microscopic uh, definition of, uh, of, the, of the model, and actually uh, taking advantage of this different definition, we end up in a situation in which uh, we can actually uh, solve the dynamics, uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Kuyandel and Kurchan, we have uh, inter integral differential equations that are able to describe uh, analytically what, is the, what the dynamics is, uh, is doing. And the result of this equation uh, show us the behavior of the energy, which is uh, slower than exponential, but not as low as the previous case. In fact, in this case, we are talking more of a power low decay. On the other hand, for the two point uh, um, correlations, uh, which are again represented in terms of uh, mean square displacement of the spin variables in this case, uh, we see similar behavior for the development of a plateau at a later time from the quench. A good advantage of this model is that it is solvable, it reproduces this phenomenology, but there is an additional advantage, which is the fact that not only we can solve the dynamics, but we can also have a direct uh, information on the structure of what? Of this function, the function of the energy, as a function of all the degrees of freedom of the system. This is uh, the landscape, the energy landscape uh, in which this dynamics is taking place. Uh, so in the space of all possible configurations. And uh, um, there have been developed different tools to have access to, to this structure, which cannot be plotted. This is just a sketch. But what one can do is to study the number 
of uh, stationary points of this uh, complicated landscape, and there are many. And uh, uh, on top of this, one can classify them in terms of their feature as uh, maxima, minima, or saddles. And this can be done, of course, in terms of the Hessian, so the matrix of the second derivative of this energy function, which is a, a, a random matrix. One can show that as the features of a random matrix, uh, whose uh, spectrum of the Hessian is in fact uh, uh, the uh, semicircle law, um, which at the beginning of the dynamics, so typically the Hessian that one can evaluate at the beginning of the dynamics uh, will be uh, the semicircle law centered in the origin. Uh, you see the code color corresponds here to the code color of the correlation. So the mean square displacement. So when time goes by in this out of equilibrium dynamics, what it can be observed is that the semicircle law shifts to the right uh, until uh, all this uh, region of negative eigenvalue disappears in the uh, infinite time limit for this uh, um, aging dynamics. I don't remember if I already called that way, uh, which is this dynamics that uh, the, the longer you wait from the uh, first quench, uh, the, the slower it gets. Now to understand, and, and here it is this connection between uh, the result on the dynamics and the result on the landscape represented on this behavior of the, of the structure of the landscape typically explored by the dynamics that can be represented and pictured in terms of this uh, cartoon where you have uh, this uh, dynamical trajectory that is exploring at first configuration at very high energy, typically, um, um, surrounded by, by saddles, this uh, black uh, circle, uh, semicircle is representing that. And then when times goes by, uh, the, 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 this uh, uh, descent in the energy landscape will explore regions that are richer and richer in saddles that have less um, unstable direction until in the long time limit, it will land on a first layer of uh, minima that are marginally stable, so the uh, spectrum touches zero. And this, uh, this level is called the, the threshold energy because it's important, it characterizes uh, uh, the, where the dynamics lands, and it's just the first layer of minima on top of many others, uh, minima that are instead fully stable. There are no zero eigenvalue for the minima underneath. So that's the structure. And in this situation, we have full control on the uh, landscape uh, um, characterization and on the dynamics. And we can connect one to one the behavior of one, uh, I mean, the, the way the dynamics evolve with the uh, typical uh, structure that is explored. In particular, for example, one can say that the, the, this plateau that is showing here is developing here is connected with the actual width of this uh, uh, minimum. Uh, so there is again this uh, full control on uh, what is doing the dynamics in this uh, uh, full space of configuration. Now, the plan here is to use this uh, um, acquired understanding uh, um, to um, different problems, starting from, we'll see uh, the machine learning setting. Uh, and in this case, uh, the question we will try to answer, which uh, has been around for, uh, for a few years, uh, is uh, why uh, uh, dynamics that is uh, essentially based on uh, gradient exploration, uh, exploration of the landscape uh, driven by, by gradient descent uh, would succeed nicely uh, in a landscape that is expected to be uh, very rough and probably full of, of many minima. Uh, so, I mean, how comes it is uh, um, performing uh, so nicely? Um, so I don't know how much uh, you need as an introduction for, for this problem. Uh, I, I have a couple of slides, uh, so I'll try to go uh, quick, reasonably quick, and then if you need uh, more, more time, we can uh, slow down. Uh, so we will focus on this uh, task uh, for machine learning, which is classification of images. So the problem is to find a, 
possible function uh, that will be able to classify images according to different labels. And this classification is, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, in the end, you want to, um, that your function will be able to spit, for example, a vector that will be uh, give a non-zero value for the label of a cat uh, when the image in input is a cat or a dog, uh, the one in correspondence of the label of a dog in the second case. Now this function is searched um, among a subset of possible functions, which are all those functions that can be parameterized by using a structure of this kind. Now what is, uh, this is the uh, neural network and what is this doing is uh, uh, evaluating uh, all the variable on each single nodes in terms of a, a nonlinear function of a linear combination of the variables that are lying at the previous layer. Um, the linear combination involves these weights that are sitting on this, each single links and uh, that would represent, will represent the parameters of the neural network. By doing this many times, uh, this neural network will be able to produce an answer given a certain input and this answer will be determined by the value of these parameters. Um, now, um, of course, the problem of finding this optimal function that will be able to classify images now becomes the problem of finding what is the collection of parameters that would allow this function to give the correct result. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the big success of machine learning comes when the number of parameters uh, has become very large. And it, on top of this, there is uh, this uh, uh, multi-layer structure that has been uh, proposed. And uh, to, uh, nowadays, we talk about 10 to the 8 number of parameters or something like that, uh, a gigantic, gigantic number. Now, I say the aim is to find this optimal value of parameters how this is realized in practice. Well, at the beginning, one starts from a random choice of these parameters and uh, evaluates the answer of the neural network, which is for a certain image, which is compared with the correct answer. Uh, and then it is evaluated, uh, for example, this distance between the uh, answer and the correct answer. And all the, uh, these, uh, these distances are summed up in what is defined the loss function. So um, this is, uh, in fact, the function that we want to minimize because if the uh, network will be able to classify everything correctly, this function should be zero. This is, for example, the mean squared loss because each single contribution comes from this uh, mean squared distance between the uh, actual answer and the correct answer. Now, of course, a standard way or a most natural way to minimizing this function will be the one of uh, um, following gradient, the gradient uh, at every single uh, position, starting from the random initial configuration. Uh, in, and this is in practice what it is used essentially, apart from the fact that for computational reasons, uh, what it is done is to uh, give an estimate of this function in terms of a subset of the images so it is not some on all the images in the training set, but a subset of them and uh, using this uh, estimate of the uh, loss evaluated on the subset of image, one can evaluate an estimate of the gradient to be followed. This is adva gives advantage from a computational point of view. And it has been studied that it introduces actually the effect, the, the, the presence of some additional noise in this, uh, um, this uh, uh, procedure of following the gradient. But essentially what we see is a full analogy with the problem that we discussed before, the physical problem of, of glass physics, in which we have this minimization of a potential in a very large dimensional space um, in presence through gradient descent uh, based dynamics in presence of, uh, of a certain amount of noise. So we thought of applying the same uh, methodology developed and used for uh, the study of glasses or uh, in, uh, for mean, spin, uh, mean field model of glasses, this example of uh, the P-spin uh, for understanding what uh, it is uh, going on in this learning dynamics and in particular to give an indirect um, uh, inform to extract an indirect information on the structure of the landscape uh, 
of this uh, loss function in this case by looking at the behavior of the dynamics, because we know that how in that case uh, the behavior of the dynamics was controlled by the structure of the landscape. So we realized uh, this problem by um, trying different uh, structure of the neural network uh, um, in dif different uh, nonlinear function, different definition of the loss function, and also different data set uh, that we used to train the neural network. And I'm showing you the result only from one of these, uh, of these um, examples, uh, uh, which do not differ much from the others. So the qualitative picture is staying the same. And uh, um, I'm, I, I show you the equivalent of the energy, which is this loss function, and in particular, this green curve here in the figure, uh, where you see, uh, in this uh, uh, lean log plot, will you see again this uh, um, logarithmic decay of the loss function, which is the one uh, that was uh, visible for the case of, of glasses. On top of this, we plotted, uh, which was the first time in this case, uh, the mean square displacement of parameters uh, in analogy with the observation that was is, is a standard procedure for, for numerical simulation of glasses. And this showed uh, again uh, this uh, typical aging behavior that uh, is um, emerged in terms of the development of a plateau. You see, here is the short time from the beginning of the dynamics, and these are the longer time, and you see the development of a, of a small plateau here. Now, at variance with the aging dynamics in the glass setting, in this case, what we also have is that at a certain point, this dynamics reaches the bottom of the landscape here, and the time transition invariance is finally restored, and on the slope of the mean square displacement, we understand that in this last regime, what this, um, this uh, learning is doing, this learning dynamics is doing is simple diffusion, which uh, points in the direction of the presence of a flat uh, region of the landscape that was possible to reach after this uh, uh, aging descent, this uh, um, uh, aging dynamics that was exploring. Similarly, we could think uh, this landscape characterized by saddles of fewer and fewer unstable direction. That's what is the intuition that comes from this observation. Of course, we do not have access on the full structure of the landscape in this case. But what we could do and what we did was also to uh, ask ourselves, uh, um, while in this case with a large number of parameters, it was possible to reach the bottom of this landscape, we, we asked ourselves what would happen if instead we would come back to a structure of the neural network that is instead in the under-parameterized regime, uh, which is the setting in which uh, a few years back, like 10 or 15 years back, um, people were working with machine learning and were not getting uh, um, any, any good result uh, in, the, in that regime with a smaller number of parameters. So what we did is to try, um, try that uh, with a smaller neural network and uh, reproduce the same observation. In this case, what we observed was this instead that this endless aging dynamics here where it's a little bit more structured than what I, sh I showed you before and also evidenced uh, in terms of this uh, um, more pronounced plateau, because there has been more time for it to develop, uh, in what it looks uh, definitely to be like an endless aging dynamics uh, that would uh, point in the direction of a structure of the landscape that is not characterized by this uh, flat region that it seems instead has emerged in the case of the overparameterized neural network explaining the importance of the addition of uh, many parameters in the sense that uh, a complicated structure like that for an underparameterized neural network get stretched in all direction, leaving the room for the formation of, of a flat region that would be possible to reach in uh, starting from random initial configuration. So in that sense, this analysis was giving this indirect understanding on the way this overparameterization is working. Of course, this study of uh, the success of neural network is not 
only limited to the problem of finding uh, why training uh, works uh, and uh, uh, it would also uh, involve all question on uh, uh, the extrapolation, so why there is not, one does not enter uh, on the problem of uh, the overfitting, which is uh, the problem that one should expect in this regime of overparameterization. But uh, I won't enter into this, uh, this part, which is uh, actually very interesting, and I uh, continue on this uh, journey that exploits this connection between landscape and dynamics to study another problem, this uh, problem uh, that is originated in, in classical inference, in which we uh, use the same perspective uh, on uh, upside down, in the sense that in this case, for uh, this uh, inference problem, uh, we'll see uh, we will be able to extract very detailed information on the structure of the landscape, and we will try to use that information to uh, predict how a gradient descent-based dynamics could do, and even try to improve the performances of a gradient descent-based dynamics that in general in inference setting is thought to be uh, very um, useless because of the presence of this many minima and, and many saddles. But uh, with the added knowledge on the landscape, we see that we can get it to match the performances of uh, optimized algorithms, such as, for example, approximate message passing, which is famous for being uh, pretty successful in, uh, in, this, uh, um, in the solution of these problems. Um, the, the problem I will be uh, showing this, uh, these results uh, is uh, uh, this uh, um, matrix I don't know how to make that disappear. Okay, that was easy. Um, so is this matrix tensor principal component analysis and a generalization that I'll discuss at the end of this slide. What is this uh, problem about? Uh, we are given a tensor, this T, and we know that it is the result of the sum of a rank one tensor uh, and some noise that is uh, independently added on, uh, on every single element of this tensor. And the aim is the one of reconstructing the rank one tensor, um, or of course, reconstructing the vector V that one can use to, to build this rank one tensor. Now, a classical strategy, inference strategy, will be the one of uh, uh, estimating, uh, so the, uh, the, the getting the maximum likelihood estimator for this uh, uh, vector, uh, which will be given by the vector x that uh, uh, minimizes uh, the distance uh, between uh, the tensor given and a rank one tensor built from uh, using this probe vector. Okay, if this uh, uh, is, uh, is zero, while well, we are uh, fitting some noise, but in principle, we are getting also some information on the vector. Now, if we're not interested into the uh, absolute value, so the, the, the norm of this vector, but only on the direction, uh, this minimization uh, becomes uh, just the maximization of the product of the, the two tensors. Okay, and uh, just uh, putting back the structure of the tensor that uh, we know uh, is there, well, we uh, just in a couple of line of computation, we can show that this maximization would correspond to minimize uh, this energy um, in the sense that uh, it minimize an energy that is uh, contains a term which is exactly alike the p spin model uh, Hamiltonian plus an additional term, which is a nonlinear field pointing in the direction of the vector that we want to retrieve. There is a prefactor here, which is the signal to noise ratio uh, that is, uh, goes like the inverse of the variance of the noise. Uh, okay, so it re reflects how important is the signal compared to the amplitude of the noise that is added. Once more, since we are interested only in the direction of the, the vector V, therefore we, uh, we can uh, minimize uh, this, uh, this quantity through, for instance, uh, naturally one could think a gradient descent based method that would work on a, an hypersphere, okay, which is the space of all possible configuration for this vector X, an hypersphere in very high dimension. 
I uh, represent this hypersphere in a three dimension here. Uh, and I put the North Pole uh, in the vector V in the direction of the North Pole. Now, this representation might be misleading because we are working in much higher dimension, but we should think that any configuration that is uncorrelated with V, so almost every configuration in this very high dimensional space, will be lying on the equator here. As soon as this X, this probe configuration starts to uh, gain some latitude on here on the sphere, uh, it will acquire a, a finite projection on the signal, which is success in this task of extracting the signal. So we are searching for uh, gradient descent dynamics that will be able to get a finite value of the latitude uh, during this at the end of the search. And of course, the possibility of being successful or not depends on the signal to noise ratio. We can imagine that for a very high value of R, this, uh, um, the surface of the sphere will be characterized by a, a function, an energy function or a risk function in this uh, particular setting that will uh, be actually characterized by a single minimum, which is located nearby the, the, the signal. Uh, on the other edge, and therefore for a gradient descent dynamics will be pretty easy to reach that solution. On the other hand of the spectrum, what we will have instead is a, um, for very small signal to noise ratio, we will have a very rough landscape. And if R is, is really tiny, uh, indeed we might have that the noise is uh, much stronger than, uh, than the signal, so that even the ground states, uh, sorry, the deepest minimum of this rough landscape might not have any correlation with the signal itself. In this uh, situation, one says that uh, we are below the information theoretic transition, meaning that even by looking at all single configuration of the, of the, um, the space of configuration, we will not be able to reconstruct the signal. In between these two extremes, there is uh, the uh, algorithmic transition. It is the when, at what value of the signal to noise ratio, uh, the algorithm that we think of, uh, of using, for example, gradient descent, will be able to escape the equator where it starts from and actually acquire a finite value of overlap or of uh, projection on, on the signal. And this is uh, the question that we want to answer whether, I mean, what are going to be the different situation depending specifically on the different value of this parameter key, which is the K, which is the dimensionality of the tensor. We will see this in this uh, pure case. So this uh, either matrix or tensor principal component analysis problem, but also in this uh, uh, mixed uh, matrix tensor principal component uh, analysis, which is a generalization of this problem, in which instead of being given one single tensor, uh, the information is conveyed through two channels. One is a matrix, one is a tensor, and we have a different noise added in the two different situations. Okay, uh, a comment here in the second case, we will be dealing with the two signal to noise ratio. So instead of one parameter, we will be dealing with two parameter and therefore we will see results and this, we will discuss uh, the different situation uh, on a phase diagram. First of all, as I uh, given the strong analogy with the PSP model, we could use it uh, and use the tools developed in that, in that field to uh, get full information on the landscape, which is the big advantage of this inference setting uh, in this particular case. Now, one of the tools we used is this cats rice formula, which is uh, uh, able to, uh, to enumerate stationary points for a random manifold, was defined, was uh, proposed uh, for that. And in this particular case, we use it to evaluate stationary point at the specific, so stationary point, this is the condition that, that tells the gradient should be zero, at a specific value of the risk function, this uh, H here, and at specific value of the latitude in this hypersphere. Now, uh, the result of this computation is a random variable, which actually, uh, it is expected to fluctuate at the exponential level, which means that its typical value can be evaluated by 
uh, in fact, averaging should be evaluated by averaging the logarithm uh, of the, 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 the random variable and then exponentiating this averaged result. This will converge to the typical value. Uh, typically, instead, uh, the, however, the computation is done in what is called the annealed approximation, in which one uh, averages straight away the, the variable itself and try to uh, get from that an answer, what it, which is typically an upper bound to the, uh, the, the, the value, the typical value of, the, of this stationary point. In certain cases, this strategy, the annealed computation, is successful anyhow, because it can be shown that uh, for special symmetries of the problem, the two results, the actual, the upper bound, uh, correspond to the typical uh, to the typical value. So the, this value that one want to estimate, but this was not the case in our case. Um, so we had to actually go with uh, uh, quench the computation, which requested the introduction of replicas, which uh, uh, amounts to um, to understand to evaluate all the moments of the distribution of this random variable. It was quite a, quite a challenge, uh, and uh, uh, thanks to the hard work of Valentina, um, uh, we succeeded in, the, in that, and we obtained result through this approach that is able to tell us about the structure of all the stationary points, again, different value of the energy, different value of the latitude. And also, uh, it, it is involved in the computation through this term here, um, the, uh, we had to go through the actual knowledge of the distribution of the eigenvalue of the Hessian itself. So for free, within this computation, we also get this classification in terms of which among these uh, stationary points are stable, unstable, and saddles. And I'll show you in the next slide the result of this, uh, um, of this um, computation, uh, which only takes into account the minima uh, of the landscape in different settings. So this is K, this parameter that uh, was appearing in the definition of the, of the model. In other words, is the dimensionality of the tensor we are talking about. Um, and uh, in the plot, I, you see this uh, red band here, uh, which is representing uh, the range in the uh, latitude for which there is a finite range in the energy where you can find uh, many minima. Okay, so this is all the region where it's hard for uh, your dynamics, gradient descent based dynamics, uh, uh, it's hard to find uh, the deepest minimum. On top of this, there is also the deepest minimum, which is plot, um, is this uh, uh, thick curve highlighted here and in all the plots. And uh, you see, if the deepest minimum has zero correlation with the signal, we are be below the information theoretic transition. So this is at zero for uh, the first case, which is pretty easy. It is a finite value for the second case, but then the information theoretic transition is uh, uh, continuous and is a, a discrete transition. So discontinuous, sorry, transition in the last two case uh, but again, the information theoretic threshold is uh, still finite. On top of the information, again, of this uh, deepest minimum, uh, there is the information of all the other minima, which again, might tell us something about the dynamics. Uh, and this as a non-trivial behavior, you see, uh, while in this case, the entire band of minima moves towards higher value of the uh, information in terms of, of the vector, it, it, it should be uh, reconstructed. Uh, this is uh, uh, less the case for, for the uh, k equal to two case in which we see always uh, the zero latitude uh, region populated by uh, this thick layer of minima until a finite value of the signal to noise ratio. That's the case k equal to two. And then instead for k equal, larger than three or equal than three, this thick layer of minima stays forever here on the, uh, on the equator, which makes us uh, expect that if we think of a dynamics that here in this uh, representation, uh, the vector is in 45 degrees on the right. Um, if we start the dynamics from the equator, which is this yellow line here, uh, this thick layer of minima, again in red, 
represented on the sphere uh, will hamper the uh, gradient descent dynamics, at least we expect that. Um, when, uh, of course, when the deepest minimum is on the equator as well, but also um, when the deepest minimum will be further away from the equator and would uh, actually contain the information, the algorithm will not be able to find it and it will not be able to find it even in the case in which the deepest minimum is isolated somewhere towards in this region where there is strong correlation with the signal because again this thick layer of minima is always staying there hampering the exploration the escaping from the equator at the initial stage of the dynamics so that's the situation that comes uh, from or the expectation that comes from the study of the landscape. And uh, uh, we uh, went further on the study of this problem by actually solving uh, the dynamic itself. And uh, we did that uh, in a different collaboration uh, uh, for the uh, in which the aim was the one of comparing the result of the uh, Langevin or gradient descent based dynamics uh, uh, with the results of approximate message passing, seeing uh, how they did perform comparatively with each other and uh, whether one was better uh, than the other and why and so on. We did that in the case of this mixed matrix uh, tensor principal component analysis where we have this region, so below the information theoretic transition, the region in which it is impossible to retrieve information is the red region here. And then there is this yellow region, which is the region in which algorithms might fail. In particular, the tiny yellow region here on the bottom below this one line here is the region in which approximate message passing fails. Above this line, approximate message passing uh, is successful, but Langevin dynamics or gradient descent dynamics of this kind um, is uh, failing for quite a while until it, this reconstruction becomes easy for, every, for everyone, for every dynamics we studied. Okay. Uh, so the first result, of course, is that Langevin is not succeeding, uh, not succeeding uh, very well, and actually is doing is quite deceiving with respect, of course, to approximate message passing, which is uh, actually thought to be optimal uh, for for this problem. Example of an example of that is uh, uh, given by this plot here, which is quite boring, is showing the result of approximate message passing. Here, you have uh, um, this uh, curve here. Um, sorry, someone is knocking. See? See? Okay, that was, was a joke for some reason. I'm sorry. Uh, so it was, uh, there is this uh, line here showing uh, um, the behavior of uh, the reconstruction of approximate message passing in terms of this information on the, on, the, on the signal to reconstruct pretty high and achieved in a couple of steps. So it's really good. And here on this bottom line instead is the way uh, the gradient descent dynamics performs. You see is doing really badly, stays in the, on zero. And this is somewhere here, okay? Now, by means of the knowledge of the landscape, what we thought was, are we able to improve the performances of Langevin here? How can we do, how can we uh, help Langevin to do better? We know that the problem is the layer of minima. And we know that this thick layer of minima around the equator, so exactly at Q bar equal to zero, is due to the presence of this uh, uh, tensor contribution. So one plan would be to give up on the information that comes from the tensor and start the dynamics, at least start the dynamics, only with the information that comes from the matrix. And then continue by putting it back, the information of the tensor, at a later stage. We perform this again in a, for a point uh, right around here, and this is what we obtained. So here you have this um, modified Langevin in which at the beginning we only use the uh, matrix contribution 
to the problem, which we are allowed to. Uh, so we are just giving up on the information that comes from the tensor. But by giving up on that information, we also give up on the noise, which is uh, the uh, most uh, problematic term in this case. Uh, the different curves um, show how this strategy is successful and showed how this uh, uh, takes place for different uh, speeds at which the second term is introduced. This is the fastest, this is the slowest here. Okay, now the conclusion of this little uh, example is that uh, um, by knowing the landscape, we were able to make a gradient descent to work better. And in particular, the uh, entire region here does shrink back to the approximate message passing hard phase, meaning that with this uh, trick, uh, Langevin dynamics becomes as good as approximate message passing meaning that at least it is possible to retrieve the information also with that scheme by this little, um, uh, by this little uh, modification. Um, I see time is uh, passing very quickly. Uh, so uh, I want just to talk about this last example in which this uh, uh, mixed matrix tensor principal component analysis uh, uh, came uh, quite uh, interesting, quite uh, um, uh, gave us a new understanding on the way this uh, dynamics work and uh, gave uh, an unexpected uh, result. Uh, I'll try to show you first the unexpected result that we obtained. Here, this is the phase diagram that uh, I showed you before, in which I just uh, erased all the information on approximate message passing and the information theoretic transition. We only have the hard phase uh, for Langevin, the phase in which the normal Langevin does fail. And this is the easy region. But then I added this additional curve here. What is this? This is the curve that one can obtain by looking at the structure of the landscape uh, for this mixed matrix tensor problem. And uh, below this curve, the structure of the landscape tells you that there is, in fact, this thick layer of minima that is hampering the reconstruction, okay? So actually, if we really looked closely at the structure of the landscape, we would have expected that Langevin would perform even more badly than what it does when we do not use the trick. To explain it better, there in this region here, we have that Langevin is successful even if it starts from a region of the landscape which is full of minima. And of course, this is really unexpected because, I mean, we think we start from a region full of minima, but then we are, Langevin, based on grad and gradient, is able to escape. And we are talking about a, a mean field model, meaning that the little noise that is present would not be able to let the system cross barriers. Okay, so we shouldn't expect to be able to escape from minima. So what is going on here? To understand what, what is the, 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 the problem, we had to come, come back to this, uh, uh, the behavior of aging dynamics, which I described as this uh, descent towards the threshold states, through well, this level of the, uh, the energy populated by these uh, minima, which are actually very flat because they are marginally stable and they are the most numerous minima. Okay, so they are typically what you reach with the, your aging dynamics. Now, these minima being very flat, they are actually the most fragile to perturbations. In particular, uh, uh, the perturbation that is, uh, and we have a perturbation in this case, which is this uh, nonlinear field. And uh, uh, in particular, it can be shown that uh, the spectrum, the distribution of, of the, of the uh, eigenvalue of the Hessian, which gives the stability, um, at a certain point, due to this perturbation, um, has one single eigenvalue that pops out from this spectrum uh, in, uh, in uh, um, a phenomenon that uh, we usually call the BBP transition after Bernard Rus by Peche, who were studying uh, this, uh, this uh, popping out of the eigenvalue for, from, from the bulk spectrum of, of, of random matrices. Um, and for the case of these threshold states, this occurs um, 
when this occurs, this uh, eigenvalue that is popping out, it becomes immediately negative because the spectrum, the bulk touches zero. What does it mean? Well, it means that they develop immediately at this transition an instability. And interestingly, the eigenvector that is associated to this eigenva eigenvalue is, has a finite correlation with the vector that we want to reconstruct. Okay, so in some way, the threshold state, which are blocking the dynamics at this very high value of the energy, are then uh, uh, facilitating gradient descent dynamics because they point in the direction of the signal and allow the dynamics to do not get trapped in all the other minima, which are still there, which are still well formed and pretty stable because they are not yet touched, that they are not yet destroyed in their stability by the perturbation, which is still too, uh, too weak uh, for, for um, destroying them. Okay, so uh, here we get through that um, an, unexpected, um, uh, an unexpected result. Con uh, as opposite to what we, we should think that the gradient descent will get trapped in, in, in minima. In this case, it is able to fly over minima and in, be directed straight away towards the, the, the signal um, thanks to this first structure, first layer uh, of minima. And uh, um, I would probably stop here to let you give, uh, um, the, to allow time for, for questions. Uh, just, uh, as a, um, just as a conclusion, uh, um, I have given you this uh, couple of examples for inference uh, in which uh, uh, we uh, could really enter into the details of this connection and learn more on how to predict the performances and even learn more, more on how to improve performances of gradient descent based dynamics, uh, which is usually something that is, uh, um, uh, is not, is not uh, um, trusted for inference problem. Instead, we show that uh, it can be used and can become, uh, give performances that are as good as optimal algorithms. Now, uh, the follow up of, of that, which I, I don't have time, but I might come back if there are questions on that, uh, is that we also proposed in this, uh, in this, uh, in this slide, um, a, a general strategy to make gradient descent perform better in the case once more of this uh, um, tensor principal component analysis and perform once more as good as optimal algorithms, which, uh, and even better than approximate message passing. But the advantage of this last uh, procedure uh, is that is uh, not only very intuitive, but is very general. So it can be applied in the, as opposite to what I showed you already, in which it was due to the structure of the problem with this matrix and the tensor, so we could get rid of one and work with the other. In this case, the strategy is fully general and can be applied to all different problems. Um, so uh, this is uh, something else that, I mean, uh, we worked on and we proposed this algorithm and also in the direction of discussing about generality of what I said, we also worked on the application, the, the retrieval of this BBP transition and this mechanism for which gradient descent is able to escape from a region full of minima in another model um, of uh, uh, inference, another problem of inference, which is a, a phase retrieval. Uh, this just to give you uh, this effort of making this uh, uh, general, in fact, uh, and, uh, and the first good results that come from there. Um, so yeah, I mean, to conclude, I, I presented you this uh, uh, double way to look at this interaction between landscape and dynamics to take advantage in the different field on uh, when we know more about the dynamics to get information on the landscape, when we know more about the landscape to predict uh, the way uh, the dynamics is behaving, and uh, this message that after all, gradient descent based dynamics might not be that bad, even in this uh, kind of situation and can probably be used uh, in, a, in a pretty fruitful way. Uh, I, I interrupt here 
uh, again, because uh, if there are questions, it's, uh, I think it's better to, to discuss. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you for this talk. So th this is open for discussion. Um, so th I should say there is a small chance, I don't know, sure. Somebody is conducting interviews for a technician and it, it's possible that we get kicked out of the session <laughs> soon. If this suddenly collapses, then I apologize in advance and I, I thank uh, Chiara in advance, but let's use the thank time we have for, 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 for questions. So if, are there any questions or comments or thoughts anybody would like to raise? I'm not sure I can see the, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, if somebody wants to say anything, then I, I propose you just unmute yourself and, uh, <coughs> and, and speak. Hi, I want just to, to ask, when you have uh, used this uh, trick of minimizing the tensor, uh, the tensor uh, inference, the, you use the trick of, of uh, minimizing first only the, the one simple part and then adding the more complex part. Is this always, the, is this always like this? Is, is this trick always working? Or sometimes you have to do anything. So you first minimize, start to minimize the, the HP equal to K equal to, so that's the order two, and then you add the, the, the other part. Is this always working? Yeah. Or there are other well, splittings which are more efficient. Well, in fact, um, there is not much. Uh, I mean, this was a specific example. Um, it's not, um, I don't know how broad is this, uh, um, is this setting. Um, this model was built up uh, on purpose uh, because uh, uh, was a, a good model. It became, by mixing up the matrix and the tensor, it became a good model for, for approximate message passing. So that's why it was built up and therefore, uh, and we could still work with the Langevin uh, setting. So uh, it, it, it became a good uh, starting point for uh, comparing uh, the, two, the two algorithms. It must be said that, uh, um, you know, approximate message passing becomes optimal um, when, uh, you know, you choose the temperature uh, appropriately and then you use um, as much as information uh, that you have from, from the signal. Therefore, this strategy of giving up part of the information, okay, uh, is completely opposite to what it would require to approximate message passing to be optimal in a way, okay? So the, the time, by the time we proposed that, um, uh, people in the collaboration that were more into approximate message passing did say, okay, but that sounds completely crazy to us. I mean, you shouldn't do that. Uh, but instead, I mean, it was the key element for us because we knew exactly that that was the problem for 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 uh, the Langevin dynamics. So it's uh, yeah, it's not standard. On the other hand, um, in a way, this uh, the result that we get a posteriori can tell us uh, uh, the way approximate message passing works in its best, uh, uh, you know, realization. Because here you see it stays. Uh, where is that? Um, it, it gets immediately there, but in some way, I mean, it's not clear what approximate message passing is doing. No one knows uh, how it is connected with the last landscape, if it is connected with the landscape. But what it seems is that uh, um, since Langevin, when you use the metrics first and the tensor later, um, uh, can go back to this dotted value here. So this uh, region, hard region shrinks back to the dotted value. It seems that this hard region here, which is the hard for A and P, is the region uh, in which even the quadratic term cannot do anything. I mean, even with only the quadratic term, you cannot do anything. <coughs> um, and it seems therefore a posteriori that approximate message passing was actually uh, implementing implicitly this uh, um, uh, smart approach of uh, giving importance first to the matrix and later 
to the tensor in a very mysterious way because we don't you cannot distinguish the two but the fact that the two uh, i mean hard phase at the end uh, match it's like saying that they fail for the same reason okay and the langevin now it fails because the quadratic term cannot be used anymore uh, to escape from the equator. And that's probably the reason why AMP also fails. But I mean, if for AMP was not clear at all, and it stays not clear, but the good thing of the Langevin is that adds uh, understanding on the problem. And from, a, I mean, a very big detour, you go back and you understand better why the other was not working and maybe opens the way to, <laughs> to get a better understanding on the A and P, for example, uh, as well. I don't know if that answer. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Anybody might have? They have a, another question. Is the, then then the, go ahead. The, nobody think, else wants. Nobody else wants. So go ahead. In the previous, I think it was in the previous slide. Uh, uh, this? No, no. Then was was much before. Uh, it, there was a um, a plot of the energy decreasing when you have a simple. No, it was um, energy decreasing when you have a, a, a neural network. Uh, and before that, uh, here, 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 this one. So I see the in the plot of the net. I see that the the when you train probably this this curve going to zero is the when you use the training set. So you are training the network, and then you go to perfect recovery. But then you see the you, you get this recovery when you have a lot of parameters to fit. So probably you are picking noise, you are picking everything, and uh, and then but there is this light green curve that goes up, the arrow explodes, it goes very bad at some moment. Could you comment? On yeah, the, yeah, on yeah, that's this, uh, this big question on uh, how this uh, proliferation of parameter affect the possibility to predict. So this big trap of the overfitting. Now, I guess this, uh, uh, this was small net, uh, um, not uh, a sophisticated uh, one for, uh, I mean, not the uh, state of the art network that will also allow the very good prediction because you see here it shoots up uh, the, um, um, where is that? The test loss uh, uh, goes back very high, meaning that for unseen images, uh, the network is doing very badly. Um, I mean, uh, the comment, okay, so that's, that's a big question. Um, there are new works that uh, deal with that uh, and that try to connect uh, this possibility of uh, these uh, chances of overparameterization wow. with also the possibility of performing uh, better at the level of predictions. So, and uh, uh, in an intuitive way, uh, we could say um, this is uh, in some way related to the flat region here. Okay. Now the problem is uh, where you have when you have uh, uh, decreased here uh, across these many saddles in this complicated landscape, and you reached the bottom. Um, you uh, the, the the bigger is this region, and the further you get from the boundary of the region, the less the the, the less uh, uh, sensitive you are to perturbation. Okay, so. Uh, all tricks that uh, try to uh, push you away from, uh, from the boundary of this uh, flat region on the bottom uh, are, I mean, all the tricks that allow you to extrapolate better can be also in some way, or at least some of them can be also interpreted as tricks to push you away from the boundary. Okay, so it's true in this case, probably, they were not implemented. They were, we were doing really the vanilla plain uh, version of the descent because we were studying really the, 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 the training rather than the extrapolation. But uh, it seems um, from other works uh, that the existence of this flat region that is uh, performed, the, the, obtained through overparameterization uh, can give the two different results depending on whether your final point is on the boundary of the region or on the center. 
Um, so yes, in this case, we didn't, uh, I mean, we didn't help it to go to the center. I mean, there are all uh, different approaches that uh, uh, try to make it uh, move further from where it lands. You know, uh, that is uh, quite hard because if it's a gradient based, if it, when it's flat, uh, you don't, you don't move. Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, and uh, and then then it's then it's hard. So what it is understood in that sense is that if you are hugely overparametrized, what you are doing is similarly as you are running this uh, gradient descent for many different uh, parallel neural networks. So is as you are landing in different points at the boundary of this uh, region, and then you are averaging out your result. That's one possible explanation for the, um, the way then at the end um, overparameterization is also helping in that in a counterintuitive way again, because that would in normal problem leads, uh, lead to overfitting. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else with any comments, questions? No? Well, if that's not the case, then we thank uh, Chiara again. Thank you. Um, yes. and, as, and as usual, it's a bit strange now to just um, hit the uh, kind of all. leave button, but uh, that's all we can do. So thank you. <laughs> and we hope at some time in the future to, to be able to in, invite you here. Uh, like yeah, in, yeah, in definitely, <laughs> definitely. Um, it was nice to meet you and uh, interact with you also in such an indirect uh, way. And I say, I, I noticed that we have um, people in the call from, well, from Germany, I assume. So Alex Hartmann is in the, in the call. So, well, thanks for joining. <laughs> um, all right. I mean, I just uh, accidentally spotted that you have the seminar series. And I mean, Hi. all these disadvantages of the uh, pandemic, this is one advantage that now yeah, one of the few. can join interesting talks from all over the world. So also thank you, Chara, for the nice presentation. Thank you so for, for, for those who for those who do not know, Alex is a professor in physics in, in Oldenburg, I believe, and focused on minima of disordered systems. So yeah, that's right. Uh, quite naturally uh, to, to, to be interested <laughs> yes. in this topic. Indeed. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye Thank bye. you all again. Bye-bye.